We're joined here today by three eminent and um, prolific activists across the spectrum of Irish politics. Um, and we're here to discuss um, current trends within British-Irish relationships. And I'm going to go straight up to Paul, Paul Stewart, and ask him, what are what is the British establishment's position vis-a-vis the six counties currently? Do they do they no longer see Northern Ireland as a vital asset for boots on the ground and the departure from the uh-huh. is the departure from the from from the UK inevitable? Um, are they trying to cultivate, given some of the media speculation, are they trying to cultivate a culture whereby people now see that? Um, uh, British departure is inevitable, and holding on to Scotland is a more, a more urgent need than anything else. I think the, I think both things are related about the attitude towards Scotland and 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 Ireland, north the north of Ireland and the south. I think the interesting thing is we all had our analysis of British imperialism in two thousand and fifteen, and we made a joke about what might happen if the British. Were the, if irony, if ironies, the British were to say, "Look, we're pulling out. There's there's, a, there's no war anymore. Bye bye, boys, and we're away." We say, wait, 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 hang on a minute. That's not our analysis. As socialists, our analysis is we have to drive you out. And I think one of the things is that whatever analysis was of British imperialism in Ireland before 1915, before 2015. Now has been a test. The last few years have, have been a real test of that analysis, and I think what it shows is that you know, as socialists, we've always understood imperialism takes different forms. The British in India, and their you know the way they did it was to basically use tribes against one another and allow local cultures to do what they did as long as the British were in control. The French imperialism is different. You know, you go tell even today you go to Algeria or Tunisia. The street signs, you know, everything looks has that French feel. They all speak, everybody speaks French or Arabic. Imperialism works in different ways. At that time, up until really after the Second World War, I can see the period from the 1950s through the 1970s as, as the long march, you know, towards national liberation movements away from imperialism. What we know is that imperialism no longer requires territorial, physical territorial domination. The boots in the ground are not necessary. <clears throat> I mean, for example, we can see this is a slight detour I'm making to make the point that if you look at Biden's, you know, American imperialism, you know, they're pulling out of, they're not supporting Saudi Arabia. Well, of course they are, but they're not, they're going to do it in a different way. This began with Trump, actually. You know, in the, in the current period, I would say imperialism depends on globalized financialization. And actually financialization doesn't require territorial physical territorial domination you can control the territory without having the boots on the ground and the french are understanding that their cost now the british were a bit cleverer i think i would say because they were able to pull out and, and use their banking finance financial institutions to rule territories and now the british this is the the, the new more and i think you know to cut a long story short because i really i appreciate there's other many other questions and 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 Tommy and Eugene are, are want to say something here, but we now know that the British, you know, if the, the British have an int- the British interest in Ireland can be seen very very graphically by that line down the Irish Sea. It's called, you know, the Brexit border, and if 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 they don't know it, because there's no reason why you know the political class should know it, but certainly the ruling class know that they can dominate rule Ireland north and south. They don't need to have troops there. Of course, there are troops in the north, we know, very, very many, many more than people recognise, you know, politically. And Tommy and I have written about, about this, about the role of the deep state in the north, that you can control a territory much more rationally with a few number of targeted um, agents. And by that, I mean, you know, the civil service, aspects of civil service, um, partly also the repressive state operators as well, by which I mean the MI5, MI6. And through the territorial domination can be secured through financial management. There is the issue, of course, the fact that the Republic of Ireland is part of the European Union, but 
that's that's a secondary issue. You know, there 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 be very very few restraints of mobility of capital. Thatcher started, Thatcher and Reagan started this. There've been very very few restraints of mobility of capital between European Union, by which we mean Republic of Ireland, and the United Kingdom, by which we mean the North of Ireland at the minute. So I would say, the British. Are, are canny now, but I think it's 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 a mark of contemporary imperialism. Uh, we, we can see, you know, but of course, you know, that's the, the, that's the elephant in the room. And there's a kind of distraction about what the DUP are doing, what their argument, because they're, they're big players, really, you know. And so for the British, the British are looking at the political class throughout the island of Ireland, and they're not seeing you know, your friends, and they're, they're not seeing Paisley and those, that coterie of, 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 of fantasists in, in, in Westminster, who are in, in that party. They're looking at the South and the political class in the South, which is much more, like, and that political class, which by the way, has access to Google, has access to Apple, you know, works with the American ruling class. These are the people the British think matter. And, uh, you know, they've, they, they look to, to see how the situation evolves. So the, the answer, the very short answer to your, your question, my very long response is, yes, Britain still does have an interest in Ireland, but it is not articulated on the ground in a physical way as it used to be because the shape of imperialism has changed. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, very interesting. Tommy, I just ask you maybe if you would focus on six counties and um, has unionism any leverage left within that centre? And what are the strands and the developments that are happening within six counties, both within unionism, locally within unionism and within Republican nationalism? I think if we take a look at uh, or listen to what Paul has said, it's very pertinent, very interesting. The relationship between the British ruling class and the six counties. Uh, undoubtedly, I think there has been a seminal change, a climate change in terms of Britain's relationship with the six counties. And I think that's been highlighted by, for example, George Osborne's article in the Evening Standard, uh, Shrimsley writing in the FT, Camilla Cavendish writing in the FT, and astonishingly, Max Hastings' comments reading from Bloomberg. So we're seeing, I believe, the climate being created in Britain where we can, where the British can part company with the north of Ireland without uh, alienating any of the far right in England, which is only a small player. In the six counties, I think we're seeing unionism has reached its, its, its peak. It's on the terminal, terminal decline. Its leverage in Westminster is gone, and I think that's long gone. And it is, has been evidenced by the protocol that was ordered down the Irish Sea, which we, when we look at what happened, Boris Johnson quite simply shafted. He betrayed, he, 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 he told frank lies to the DUP, who over, well overestimated their strength and their bargaining power, uh, believing that they had some old imperialist hold over Britain, which they just don't have. What they don't realise is the old Palmerstonian observation that Britain has no permanent enemies, Britain has no permanent allies, Britain has only permanent interests. And when we're talking about Britain, we're talking about the British ruling class uh, and the Northern Unionists or Northern Nationalists even less. They, they don't have any influence over the British ruling class, the people, the deep state, the, 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 the permanent government, the people that, that pull the strings in Britain. Unionism is at a lost end. The DUP supported Brexit, the hardest possible form of Brexit. They hadn't even the political intelligence to recognise the deal that Theresa May was offering. They pulled the rug from under Theresa May. They found themselves in a position where they supported uh, Boris Johnson with the bizarre situation where Ian Og Paisley was up crying the blues in the House of Commons. Why did you do this to us? Has he not even read Edward Carson's uh, statement in the House of Commons a hundred years ago, this type of thing, these people who claim to be unionists don't even, I think, understand their own history, but there's always, always been this fear that the, ultimately in their heart, they know that they, they have little influence. The, the Northern Ireland as a 
strategic asset to the British state it has long gone. Britain is no longer a global superpower in the way it used to be. Uh, the deep water port up in Derry is no longer a, st a vitally strategic asset. So in terms of their military capacity, the British don't re can re regard it necessary to have boots on the ground economically. Northern Ireland is an irrelevancy in terms of the British economy. And there is then the other aspect that the demographics are changing inexorably. And this has happened over the last 20 to 30 years because no longer can the unionist regime manipulate the economy to the advantage of its unionist majority and force effectively force into exile or emigration the, the, their nationalist opponents, critics. So I think the British have made a calculation that it's inevitable that the North will go and then their game plan now is to manage the transformation to their advantage as they have done in so many other parts of the empire over the last century as the retreat from empire. And even to the extent they, they manipulated the transformation here in, in the Republic of Ireland in 1921 when they effectively ordered McCollins to, to shell the four courts for to launch a civil war to ensure that there would be a, a colonial government established in, in, in Ireland here sympathetic to the British Empire and Commonwealth, which they did. But in the North, the North is now surplus to requirements, as far as the British are concerned. Unionism has not come to terms with that and is posing and talking, as we saw about the protocol, they're threatening violence, but it's a, it's a two-edged sword for them. How do they threaten violence? Who, do, who are they going to threaten? Who and how, how are they going to perpetrate it? We have the usual hypocrisy, the deep-running hypocrisy from the DUP, threatening violence, indicating that violence may emerge from their loyalist neighbours. And at the same time, the loyalist working class, several of their leaders are telling, quietly telling the DUP that they are not going to be used one more time, used and abused one more time. Uh, so we are left in this situation that what we're looking at now is unionism in many ways has a certain position within Northern Ireland within the six counties, but not any longer within the United Kingdom. They don't, they're not a player. Scotland is the big uh, prize for the British ruling class to hold on to Scotland. Northern Ireland can be separated, lost, and they're going to recognise the inevitability that they will be moving out. So therefore the game becomes one now for the British ruling class, for imperialism in general, how to manipulate the transformation. And I think Eugene will certainly deal with that in more detail than I will, but we're looking at the, the role to be played now by what's known as civic nationalism, and possibly even Sinn Féin has, had a, a Sinn Féin has changed its position over the years. It now supports the European Union, albeit, albeit certain critically, but it still supports the European Union. It is <coughs> of the US troops down in Shannon, it, uh, but certainly it's the civic nationalist who are even far to the right feel very comfortable with the type of regime that is in place at present in the Republic. And we can then expect that unionism is no longer the monolith that it was before the fall of Stormont in 72. Mm. We're seeing what the uh, Alex Kane, a very astute observer of unionism, describes as garden centre unionism, up to possibly 20% of the, what would be broadly speaking, the, the greater unionist family now vote alliance would be content to stay within the United Kingdom, but will not raise any physical difficulties if, if there's a vote for unity. So, uh, so Tommy, um, um, in the recalculation of um, what is useful to British imperialism, um, where would you put Sinn Féin's position in that role? Have, have Sinn Féin now become um, the new proto-unionist party in, 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 in reality? No, I, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Mm -hmm. I, I think the British position for Sinn Féin is to allow Sinn Féin to become the quiet opposition, almost like the British Labour Party, the, the, uh, in the sense that so long as they don't rock the boat, they go along with the, the, the status quo. Uh, their, their relationship to the European Union has changed. Their tolerance for the United States has changed. As long as they tolerate the new emerging uh, climate, 
business. So long uh, we, we're we, we're hearing Sinn Fein spokespersons now talking about the need to have competition within the banking sector. Uh, we on the left say <laughs> finance should be nationalised. There is no role for the private sector or competition in finance because we're talking about taking the the, the financial ability into the, into the hands of the people. I mean. Sinn Féin have not critiqued or criticised the euro, for example. Having a euro, uh, transferring your power to create to create sure. finance, I, I mean, that's, a, that's an abnegation of sovereignty. But I wouldn't go so far as to say Sinn Féin are, are, are unionists. I think they are quiescent in the overall situation. They're willing, to, they're willing to buy into business. They're willing to buy into the private sector. They're willing to buy into the militarisation that is emerging from within the European Union. They're tolerant of the US... Boots and Shannon. They don't want to close down Facebook with its intelligence gathering facilities in Dublin. So, so long as they behave, as I say, like new Labour, Sir Keith or Sir Keir Starmer leading the, the, the Labour Party. And I, I, they're, they're, that, that will be the role for Sinn Fein. If you like, the almost the valuable role played by the British Labour Party. In providing, I feel like a, a lightning rod to the to the working class, to which can diffuse the the revolutionary potential within the working class. So long as you have the Labour Party, it, keep, it, it actually acts as a guardian on the working class. You can be, you can advocate Irish unity, albeit Irish unity within the parameters that are suitable to imperialism. And I think that's the role for Sinn Féin, not so much unionist, as if you like the the police person <clears throat> of, of of republicanism. Okay. Um... Eugene, if I could go to you back and, and maybe you'd explain um, or give us your views on what's happening in the South and in this um, recalculation of imperialism and as Paul's pointed to, um, it's rethinking of itself. What is the establishment position vis-a-vis -vis the North in, in the South um, and their attitudes towards the border, border pole? Um, have what are the, 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 we understand that capitalism all, often has um, divided interests and we'll, we'll express these in different ways, but are there connecting interests between, um, between Britain and uh, the south of Ireland in, 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 in this imperial plan? Um, I think there's um, what has a century on of the establishment of Stormont um, just to, uh, from as I understand it, there, I think there's been a century on, a century uh, whenever partition was began to be floated around 1919, 20, 21. Uh, uh, we have to remember that partition um, was not part of the debate during the whole um, treaty debates, because uh, we all thought it was going to be solved by the boundary commission uh, that was to follow. Um, so therefore, everybody thought that, as most thought, that there were going to be a, a, a partition wouldn't really be a, a long-term uh, goal. Um, and I think that all people underestimated the role of the British at that time uh, in managing and guiding the process. And even unionists found out to their own uh, thing that they actually were also sold a pup by the British in regards to um, Carson then was talking about uh, being once again being uh, led up the garden path, and I think today it, we should be careful about. Um, I think uh, imperialism is extremely flexible. It's extremely flexible uh, in how it manoeuvres. I don't think it ever puts itself in it, all its eggs in one basket. I think it actually tends to have a number of number of um, scenarios at play at a given time. I think it's all about managing. It's about managing their interests and managing the process. Um, and I do believe, as uh, Paul pointed out, and, J and Tommy, um, imperialism, uh, I don't think there's such a thing as a benign imperialism. I think imperialism operates and, and functions uh, on its own self-interest and what, it, what its, its material interest and, and needs are at a given moment in time. And I think at this moment in time, the Irish establishment um, have, they have uh, made their peace with imperialism, regardless whether that would be the uh, European Union, the United States, or with uh, Britain itself. Um, so it's about managing its relationship to imperialism. Um, I think that's what it's about. Uh, there's different levels of dependency with, with the Irish establishment. Um, uh, I think that the Irish establishment itself is, uh, I wouldn't think it'd be overly 
keen on the United Ireland. Um, I think there's a there's a questions about it. I think the whole question of look, reflecting back. I think the where the articles two and three in the uh, the Republic's constitution was presented a constitutional imperative uh, for unity. Uh, with the removal of articles two and three, that constitutional imperative has been removed. And therefore, now we can see now the political flexibility that has emerged um, there all within the establishment. Um, and I think that's where it gives them room to manoeuvre and whether they wish to engage with or want to have a united Ireland. I still think the question of mm. would the Irish capitalist class have the capacity uh, if they were confronted by a, a unified working class movement? Um, would they be able to cope with that? Would they be able to deal with those political forces? Because um, I do think that that was a factor way back in the time period of partition. I think the both the unionists and the, the um, how you say the nationalist uh, class in Dublin were terrified of, of a somewhat of a resurgent uh, working class movement. And uh, we have to remember that uh, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union uh, was decimated after the 1913. Um, but was rebuilt in the period from 1913, particularly in the period of 1918, 1919, 1920, uh, was rebuilt to, to, to a membership of over 100,000. That was rural and urban workers. Many of those were actively nice. involved in the national independence struggle. Um, so the ruling class knew who was involved in the national independence movement. And I think with unionism as well, uh, it was commonly talked about the, uh, the, emer the sort of the onward march to unity of the working class at the time. So it suited both unionism and the nationalist forces to have uh, uh, to have the working class divided and um, and uh, marginalised in the political process. <coughs> I think that's uh, to a degree. I still think that is the situation today. Um, uh, I think that uh, we have a big job of work to do in the Republic because we've had uh, many decades of uh, revisionist history. Um, many decades of um, attacks upon the whole idea of national democracy, national independence, national sovereignty, national unity. There's been a decades upon that, and I think that's a that's a that's a, a big and ideological struggle we're going to have. Um, and regards mm -hmm. to uh, the north and central at uh, the border pole and things like that, I think um, uh, the old saying, "I'm not too sure about all this," um, but um, the people who vote the SDLP, do they are they voting for Irish unity? I'm not too sure. Uh, do all the people who vote for Sinn Féin voting for Irish unity? I'm not too sure. Um, so I don't think necessarily that the the changing uh, the changing demographics are necessarily a changing demographic that uh, towards the United Ireland. I think there are changing demographics as to what people want out of life and what they are looking for. And uh, do people feel that their self interests are going to be met in the United Ireland, or they would be met within the British state? And I think these are the processes which Britain has been cleverly doing. They've been managing the peace process, what is called the peace process, over the last 30 years. They've managed it uh, in their own interests. And I think in the South, the Southern establishment will manage the debate, if there is to be a debate around the question of a border poll, they will manage it uh, to see, and their calculation will be, uh, not some romantic rose-tinted rose glasses of the United Ireland to be the class that we establish a unitary state, uh, be, they will base it upon their capacity to maintain their interests. And uh, I think that's what the case will be. So uh, I think it'll be a, a long battle taking place around, around this. And I think it's about all of those sides, both British imperialism, the Irish establishment, the European Union, will all be managing their own self-interest. Uh, and within that, the working class itself will be marginalised uh, in that debate. And I think it's the objective of and the role played by progressive left Republican forces is to bring out uh, the demands and the clarity of the demands uh, of the working class, of the rural and urban workers, uh, small farming communities and all that. That, that. that is our task is to draw those, those uh, demands, those aspirations into the open and place them on the table uh, because it, it is about a future, the fight for the future. And I think the future- Just come to that maybe, if I could hold you there Eugene, could hold it at, at the end. Um, uh, Tommy has particularly put forward the thesis that there's a, 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 an inevitability about unity and that um, Britain has come to their conclusion. But I would ask, given that project globalization, um, we could see this possibly emerging if there was um, the global project and the, the conglomerations of capitalism 
getting ever bigger and bigger, um, as seemed to be the unstoppable process. But Brexit and um, and, and, and particularly national interests have um, disrupted our, many people's views of, of how that um, global process within capital was working. Has the advent of Brexit, the likelihood of um, a trade war or the, the apparent emergence of a trade war between Britain and Europe, <clears throat> has that scuppered project um, Project United, uniting um, the the island of Ireland under a bourgeois capitalist system, um, that, that that might have happened under the mechanism of the European Union. Are we in a situation where um, those buying interests of British imperialism and um, European <coughs> bourgeois interests are now at such a conflict that they're going to manifest themselves? Um, on the island of Ireland and scupper what we had thought would emerge as um, as just inevitable coming together of their interests. Could I just go back to Paul on that? <laughs> I think that, um, as you, you know, the point that Eugene makes very well that, um, you know, the imperialism, you know, as a social historical force, capitalist force, dominant bourgeois na capitalist nations, it it takes different forms in different different ways, different times, and <clears throat> I mean, like the working class movement is contradictory, and obviously we know that it is because we're, we're trying to work within it. We've been signally unsuccessful wherever we are in actually making social revolutions. And by the way, any revolutions that do occur always end up in the sphere of capitalist, you know, so we, we know that. Mm -hmm. It's what they can do. I think it's how they look around, the mischief they can make. I mean, let's not forget that there's more unionists pissed off with, with divided Ireland than there was, I mean, I exaggerate to make the point, than there was nationalists. Don't forget the Irish Unionist Alliance had over 60,000 members south of the border in the counties of Monaghan, Cavan, you know, and, and, and Leitrim. But there's more members, there's more members in the Irish Unionist Alliance than there was in Belfast, you know, and but after, and, and they felt sold out mm -hmm. by partition. But so it, it was, I mean, it could, have been, it could have been anything, you know, the unionism was a divide within Irish society that was obviously more or less important, but, you know, divide, supported them by divisions within the British ruling class, you know, you know. Mm. And and the, that was advantageous for them, and you know Eugene, you know and you know Tommy, know you know in 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 the Republic now, of course, the, you know the Unionist now is the blue shirt, and um, you know it's whatever it's it's about the unity of, I mean they're embarrassed, you, you know thank goodness there's 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 enough people enough of the time to embarrass them, otherwise you would have parades every other week to the black and tans, you know. You know what I'm saying? That that the, the, the imperialism seeks the, the the allies, as Tommy said, the allies that it can, that it can rely on, and those can change through time. It doesn't really matter what color they are, you know, or or what badges they wear, or what they call themselves, or even what language they speak. I mean, it mattered to the French; they all had to speak French. But the British could put up with people speaking twenty different languages in India, you know. It, so I mean, that's just to make the point. That, yeah, I mean, I agree, imperialism, and if if. If Irish unity was, they wouldn't be bothered, not interested, because they can rule it through, you know, as our great, you know, as Connolly himself said, you know, through the financial institutions and so on, it will do that. And and if, and you know, I did, I'm aware I didn't answer your, to respond to your question about, about Scotland at the beginning. But to Paul, particularly, I mean, could I ask you, that, uh, just around this issue of, of um, yeah. the development of Brexit and um, the looming contradictions between um, uh, conflicts between British imperial interests and European imperial interests, um, how they impact on this question of what appeared to be the inevitable project in uniting Ireland under uh, in a European context. Uh, will I think how do you see mind. those? Yeah. yeah, will this copper that? Will this take the wheels off that project? No, I don't. I don't think it. 
the, the project, sorry, of which project? Oh, the project, it, said, it, it, what it seemed to be from our discussions, it seemed apparent that um, British imperialism was at least facilitating um, discussions around the reunification of Ireland um, under, uh, under, no, under no, no, the, no, I, I don't think so. I think it hastens it, actually. I think that there, I think it lets out. Well, there's two things. One is okay. within the British ruling class, there, there are clearly divisions. You know, we know that because within Brexit, you know, the, 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 you know, the cap our British capitalists, they would have, the, and by the way, you know, the vote, it could have gone either way, frankly. You know, had it been managed better, Britain would still be in the European Union. So these things are, let's not take out conjuncture and the unpredictability of history, you know, the things aren't inevitable the way the way they work themselves out. But what's happened is that it's given clarity to the nature of British capitalism in a way which maybe wasn't the case because both British workers and British capitalists were protected by, they were shielded by the power of, you know, this is a, this is a you know, European, Britain's what, 70 million people, the European Union is four to 500 million, you know, with the, the, the you know, it's the second largest block in the world, you know, global trading block. So Britain is now minnow in that. It, but it, but Britain, but, you know, the British, they the use the, the imagery, as we know, of imperial past in order to promote a different imperial future. And that imperial future is one which is about deregulation. It's about breaking labour markets. It's about under cheapening labour. It's about making labour more amenable to demands of capital. It makes Britain more open than it did previously because if it's part of the World Trade, World Trade Organization rules, then it becomes subject to different criteria. So the, 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 the kind of myth, of course, because that was all nonsense, wasn't taking back control, but of course it didn't. It gave control anyway, not only did not give control to the British working class or British people, um, but of course, it gave control to a particular kind of strand within British capitalism, British and British and that new financial British imperialism, which can trade anywhere, everywhere at any time. So it deregulates, it deepens the project, the Thatcher project, and makes it more likely to be the case. And so, the the fact that I'd see what I mean, I understand what you're saying. That would it not be then, you know, fragment that unitary British notion because suddenly a, a border down the Irish Sea puts part of Britain in, in the orbit of the European Union. But Britain's in the orbit of the European Union. I mean, arguably it's more in the orbit of the European Union now before, because to trade with Europe has to abide by European trade rules, regulations about, you know, about sanitary care, about, you know, good provision of goods, standard health and safety regulations. Whereas before through its apparat checks and civil service bureaucrats who could negotiate deals for themselves, you know, now, it, you know, it, you know, as part of the dialectic here, we have to look at Britain is more subordinate to the European Union now than it was before. And of course, because, you know, because the other periodist interests, the Americans are more interested in alliances with the European Union than uh, well, Germany. I'm going to put this to Tommy. So it's just, just, it's just an issue, you see. So I don't think, and then there is, sorry to hog it, but then there is a dialectic in, the, in, in Ireland itself, which is if Britain's saying, look, there's a shift here, you know, um, towards this demographic shift, what's well, who's going to fight this? Do, this isn't important. What, how can we maintain our sphere of interest? How can we? How can Irish, you know, British capital still have a role? You know what? And and I think that that's the dynamic that I, I well, that'd be my interpretation anyway. Um, it will deal with the situation as, and it's got people in Belfast and Castle Ray and so on to, to try and manage that in some way. You know, can't control everything. Who could have seen Brexit, right? You know. Okay, I just Who can't could help me with this same so, question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for that. Um, Tommy, you know, given that um, we understand the selfish interests of of, of the, the the big powers and um, that, that they're going to serve the bourgeoisie, um, Irish bourgeoisie, Irish interests are, you know, what are we? One percent of the European Union. If there are competing interests between Britain and Europe, how significant or will Ireland become a casualty or the, the, the Irish unity become a casualty of that uh, process? Same question in another, in another way. I'm not sure that it will. I, I don't think the differences between the European Union, I think as Paul has been alluding to, between the European Union and Britain are as stark as you might imagine. We're not looking here at the William and James battling it out for the crown. And you know, we're not going to see another 
Battle of the Boyne here between the French and England and addressed in, in, in Ireland. We're not, we're not in that situation. Uh, I think if you look at, for example, the European Union wishes to maintain a strong relationship with the UK and vice versa. And all you have to look at is the recent spat over vaccines. And look, if the European Union was serious about holding on to vaccines, it would just simply stop the export of vaccines to the United Kingdom. But they haven't. They have held exactly. on. And then mm. on the other hand, if you're looking at the situation where the loudest, shrillest voice to not to uh, put an export ban on EU exports to Britain was Michal Martin. So what I think you're looking at a situation where Michal Martin and he, yesterday in the Financial Times, he said, talked about resetting the need to reset the relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. So mm. there is, there is, I think there's economic interests at stake in both cases. There's pragmatic political interests at stake. And of course, in Ireland mm. here, we have the craven uh, bourgeoisie, comprador bourgeoisie that has effectively no confidence in itself. It, it, it has confidence in its special branch and its army to hold the situation for them. They're, but their, their faith is put in maintaining an economy that's run for them by American multinationals. They, they, they don't have, they don't have the self confidence. We're not talking Irish bourgeoisie is not doesn't have the self confidence of the Yankee capitalist class, the British capitalist class, the French and German capitalist class. It, 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 it's a comprador local neocolonialist bourgeoisie. But in terms of will this difference between Britain and the European Union prevent Irish unity? I'm not sure that it will. In fact, I don't think it will. I think they're going to look at it in a different light. And when we're talking about inevitability, I'm not talking about the next few weeks or maybe months, but there is, there's a situation here that mm -hmm. and we'll have to look at several scenarios. Demographics do not necessarily mean that every Catholic will vote for United Ireland. I think that's a, that, that, that would be to vulgarise the argument. But if mm -hmm. that Catholic majority emerges in the six counties, it will fundamentally change the din political dynamics within the six counties. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's the calculation that's going to have to be made. Do, do, do the British ruling class want to see a situation where we have conflict in the north? Can the southern bourgeoisie tolerate that situation? Effectively, a, a sort of a semi-autonomous Sinn Féin manipulated state in the north. And Sinn Féin will find itself, if it is, and, and it will presumably be the largest party on the nationalist side, they will have to become, in order to hold a position, even maybe possibly more culturally aggressive if there isn't a vote for unity. Mm. They'll be demanding the widespread use of the Irish language. We'll be talking about pre Iron and Tushkart uh, and, and, and Choctaw and Crook instead of Stormont. Uh, you'll be talking about Tushkart and Heron. You'll have the uh, Royal Avenue will be transformed into Bobby Sands Boulevard. That, that's the type of situation you could be looking at. So the... the, the Imperative here, if I am talking about inevitability, there's an imperative to, trans to carry out the transformation to the, in the interests of the, of the powers that be. That's the element of inevitability. So do the European Union, do, do, will there be this massive confrontation along the border between Monaghan and Tyrone because, in the, because the, the, the German and French uh, ruling class who effectively manage the European Union do they, do they want a confrontation there with Britain? Does the British ruling class want a confrontation? No, they don't. And I, I believe they'll come to a deal, a sensible, pragmatic deal as, as, as they will. So I think there's, there's so many different aspects to the calculations about the future of this island. Okay. There's, there's no simple one simple solution. Absolutely, it's a dialectical position. Just interested in investigating and, and allow Eugene to have, have a, a view on that. But given, uh, and I would, maybe you'd refer Eugene to you know, the re-emergence of, of um, these national capitalist interests, um, you know, that you can see we manifest in Trumpism with um, America first and the, the, what we had been led to believe was the hegemonic position of um, global capitalism over uh, the, those interests over everything. It now it seems to be that these capitalist interests are manifesting themselves. Is capitalism in a crisis that will 
the, 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 whereby they're 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 now attacking each other. And this is the question for Ireland. I think there's always a difference. There's always a difficulty. I think of being very prescriptive about everything. I think because things are always constantly in a constant state of change. Um, I think there's we have to. I would look at the question of say the British relationship to Ireland uh, before Brexit. Economic and political border were the same. And between uh, the British border and Ireland was both the economic and political border were the same. Uh, today, the economic border between Britain and the European Union is now down the Irish Sea. But the political border of the British in Ireland has remained as it was since 1921, 22. Uh, so therefore, there's a, that is a question which comes down to it that, um, as Paul said, uh, Brexit was an historical accident. Uh, it was not necessarily the, the uh, how you say, the settled, vo- fo- settled view of all of the British ruling class. It was certainly a view of a section of the British class, uh, the ruling class, uh, wanting to leave uh, uh, the European Union. Um, and I think, I don't think the majority of them did. So as part of an historical accident, but everything else, it, took them, it has taken them some period before, before they can find, their, re-establish their relationship. And I think what May, what Patricia uh, May had said about uh, about the European Union or Britain, that they want a special relationship. And I think that that's what both uh, John, uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Theresa May have secured, is a special relationship between uh, British capital and the European Union. Um, the European Union also, I mean, where they have also not just about to deal with Britain, they have the strong difficulties of um, if Britain leaves, uh, has left the European Union, uh, making the, those, that transition, that leaving uh, as difficult as possible. There's also other forces contending in Europe, that Europe is not of itself, there's contending issues. Uh, there's lots of countries in Europe who are actually unhappy with um, the centralised decision making, the imposition of policies. Um, so European Union sees itself that, uh, that uh, there could be a huge dislocation within Europe if, to a degree, the British uh, Brexit was a success story from their point of view. And you can see the reluctance of even the reaction towards imposition of um, lockdowns across Europe, restrictions on travels, uh, that, that immediately opposed national, national dimensions to, to um, health problems. And I think that they were had troubles coping with this. And uh, to a degree, is one of the factors why I think the European Commission uh, seized control of the vaccines was to re-establish some sort of a centralised authority and control over governments acting upon themselves. And I, so I think these are all things that are coming into play uh, around this issue um, and around the question of Irish unity. Uh, I hear what Tommy is saying about the question of the, the dynamics that take place. It will also be a dynamic, for instance, if, if um, Sinn Féin is in government in the uh, instalment um, and is also uh, in government in the, in the Republic, it also has to, how do you say, uh, meet the aspirations of its own core base. Uh, of a, I was a party that uh, advocates Irish unity, uh, believes in Irish unity, uh, sort of operate within two functional uh, governments, partition governments, and I think that will cause difficulty for 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 Sinn Féin, difficulty for uh, that way. And you can see why the reaction of the establishment towards the rise of Sinn Féin. I think they are very very reluctant because. Uh, they are themselves, I don't think, are strong enough to manage the process and therefore they need the allies of the European Union, they need the allies of the British to sustain and to manage that whole process. So they've got this levels, layers of dependency, as I said before, there's layers of dependency within the Irish establishment between their, their dependency upon the European Union, the dependency upon the British and all that. And so therefore they're, on, they're, not, they're not control of, the, they're not control of the, uh, the puppet master, they're not controlling all the, all the players on the stage. They are control of certain play on the stage, but not all of the play. I think that is what has them concerned. It has them concerned because they're not too sure what will possibly be the outcome. Whereas British imperialism, imperialism in general, has to a degree, because of centuries of experience, have um, lay, have plans which they have laid out and tried to implement over a long period of time. They take a much more strategic, long-term perspective on their on on their process. And I think um, that is reflective in. And, and, and many of the issues that Britain has had, has always had a long term strategy towards Ireland, and as he always said, it, it is the cutest and the most uh, devious of all the ruling classes of Europe. It has got centuries upon experiences uh, to draw upon, and that's why the, the, the battery of institutions, the Sandhurst, something else, don't talk about battles 
military battles or political battles of yesterday, of yesterday or last year. They talk about political and military battles of centuries ago. Mm. And they brought that experience up through the political process. So they have a very clever uh, strategy. I therefore wouldn't okay. want to undermine that. So I think the question of where the European Union is going to go and where Britain is going to go, I think that imperialism will, be, will do whatever it thinks is necessary at a given moment in time. And I do think that, the, like all those things, we cannot allow ourselves to think that they're all masters. They have many contradictions on the basis of how, they're, how those contradictions are exploited by us is the key question. It's a key question, I think, because... All right. Can I are, just stop you there, there Eugene? And, yeah, that, because you're sort of anticipating, and I can allow the others to, to jump in on this. And we understand that there, there are at least um, three imperial blocs in, 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 involved in exploiting Ireland and exploiting the class in Ireland and the European Union, the, U, uh, the, the United Kingdom and the USA. How, just briefly, given that long-term planning um, that would be part of, of, of the control um, and, and um, imperialism itself. How would you view their, those blocks, their view of um, where Ireland should head and, and uh, the possibility of new constitutional arrangements in Ireland? Yeah, I'll go to you, Paul, just for a sec. Let's start with you. I think it, again, it comes back to what we were saying. And you can you can see in a way what you might do. In, I, we didn't deal with the question you'd raised initially in, in the um, in the prep, you know, about Scotland, because mm. maybe that's a, a good good idea of what what they might do and what they might do is 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 basically be agents of influence, not as an influence as in people in the Republican movement that were used in certain way, but but certain, the political figures in the media and in political parties to try and steer interests in their way or to make alliances with these people, not con control, but to make alliances, give, you know, make it, these are people you can do business with basically as Tommy I think said initially, you know, um, our allies are people that can help us to extend our interests in the in Scottish case. Um, you know, I think it's a, a, the, 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 the Alba party's in an interest in, um, development. It's it doesn't it doesn't undermine it, the independence movement, but it gives the British British establishment, the British ruling class, space to try and influence the outcome of, of Scottish independence referendum. And I think that you you know we're talking about. I think they would the British are you can see them doing that in the Republic, you know, in, in Ireland in the Republic of Ireland, where their main allies are obviously, you know. Radker and his friends, but also the they're quite happy to, to, to Sinn Féin to be domesticated, you know, the sign of domestication is their participation in, in, in the doll not, you know, they're not theirs, wouldn't be play a role as oppositionists. As Tommy was saying, they'd be like the, the you know, the the defanged um, Labour Party. But they've been part of that process for long, you know, these things don't happen over, they've been going on for a long, long time. They're, they're quite happy to accommodate that. I mean, the thing about the European Union is it's not a country. You know, right? It's not a ruling class. It's it's dominated by Germany and France, and and and, and Spain, and and Italy's in a, in a you know some way behind that. And the alliances that the, the German, the French forces, the capital want to make will determine what the relationship of the European Union is to to United Ireland. They quite happily accommodate that. The GDP of of, of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, is smaller than GDP of Denmark, and the GDP of Denmark is is smaller than than, than the, the you know the annual turnover of of, of Amazon. <laughs> you know the, the, the countries are small, you know the these are the, you know and and so um, BMW the, you know own Presley runs Bavaria, you know and the, the GDP of, of Bavaria is bigger than than the GDP of Republic Ireland, you know so in, in these companies are massive institutions and and if if they do, if they can be accommodated within the European Union they're quite they're quite happy to do that they'll mediate that, and I was reading uh, it's interesting response from you know the the um Joe Broly Joe Broly's thing you know the footballer the the, the, the debate around his um is uh, an RTE, the, the way he was cut, you know, what was said about him. When you read his, what he had to say, 
Um, you know, obviously in the left, he would say, well, you know, because he, what he was saying about what, would, what he would like to happen, what might happen, how United Ireland might come about. There's a, that's a right wing that, you know, but actually it's perfectly possible that, that imperialism would settle with the, that kind of United Ireland, it's federal Ireland, where the where Stormont has its wee place and it does its own thing. And Tommy has argued before that a way to make that work would be to make sure all the PSNI people's pensions were guaranteed, you could buy them their houses, and you could give the loyalists extra taxis to, to run in, in North Belfast, and there wouldn't be a problem. You know, that we are not in a position to be saying this is what and how it will work. We would like to be the people that are calling the shots. So we're, what your, your question is, the people that are the dominant, you know, the, dom, the, the capitalist class, you know, where, where, where capital goes, labor follows. And the same way where, where, you know, where imperialism goes, we have, to, we have to cope with that, you know, because they came into our company and did what they did. So we had to respond to that, you know, that war for okay. the, the most recent one, 40 years. Right. I'm going on a bit, but just no, 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 you're not. So I, just subconsciously. So we can we can see how we can see how, how capitalism will they, they will put up with any however the dialectic you know where they will they, they will try to manage that to the best their interest. They can live with anything. They can live with China and accommodate yeah. that in the world. Do you know what I mean? They can, you know. So okay, I, I think that work, brings us on to uh, unfortunately. Okay, Paul. Thanks, but um, I think this brings us on for. If, um, I'm just thinking of, of uh, time here, but it brings us on to our, our final question. And, and really it's a question about what, what is to be done? Um, what do we need on the left need to be doing? Um, if it's a long-term project, do we have to, do we look at the Good Friday Agreement? And um, do we work to internally, uh, what can we do internally in the six counties to bring about um, an end to that um, sectarianization of the institutions of state and power, even as a, a, as a short-term gap. But in the long term, how do we shape and where do we influence um, oh, the, 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 the views of the class and how do we bring forward the interests of the, of the working class in um, the calculations around new constitutional arrangements in Ireland? Tommy? We're broadly here, the three of us, four of us in agreement that the greater capitalist interest was quite comfortable, even with Irish unity, so long as it abides by what a former Taoiseach Enda Kenny one time described that he intended to make Ireland the most best little country in the world to do business in. And if that's the case, then they, they can accommodate any situation where that's, that remains mm. the status quo. Uh, I think what we have got to do is keep in mind that to a large extent, sectarianism is not something genetically programmed within the population in the six counties of Northern Ireland. It has arisen as a result of the creation of the state of Northern Ireland and how it came about. And to end sectarianism on this island, religious sectarianism of the type we're talking about in, in the six counties, effectively my view is that we have to end the political entity that is the six counties. There is no point thinking that that sectarianism, this beast that's called sectarianism, can be can be wished away or argued away because the forces are so strong to maintain it. So we have to talk about ending the state that created sectarianism. And that I think is 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 the is the position. Can we do it? Well, I think at all times, and I'm I'm actually we have got at all times to go back to the old Gramscian thing of. Maybe I'm pessimistic of the mind, but always keep optimistic of the heart. And we've got to keep optimistic of the ability of the working class to train, transform society. Uh, and this has happened in the past so many times. We, we, we sometimes, because it didn't produce a Bolshevik revolution, we say we, we tend to dismiss it that it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a, a revolutionary transformation that there has been. And I'm at the moment actually reading a book about the British working class. Uh, Seamus Millen's book called The Enemy Within. And I, and I, when you read the, about the amount of support there was for the NUM and the minor strike right across the British working class, it, it defies the narrative that the capitalists, the ruling class have put out in Britain that they were marginalised or anything but it. And that was why such an effort was made to smash that people. So you have revolutionary transform transformative potential within 
they work class now, and we can sometimes dismiss it in Britain, but certainly in Ireland, so many times we've come up to challenge the status quo. So I think we retain our faith in the ability of the people, the wide mass of the people that suffer under this iniquitous system of, of private enterprise and free market capitalism to transform society. Our main task at the moment, since we don't have the, the numbers with us, is to provide a clear analysis and to deliver that to, to the people in terminology that people understand. Obviously, there are certain pieces of, of work that we have to do theoretically that can only be where we have to use certain terminology. But I mean, this, this is a simple message. It's who controls the wealth. The people that make the wealth have to control the wealth and that we do have the ability to look after ourselves. The thing about Ireland to remember is that, as Paul talks about, rightly so, that the GDP of Ireland is, is minuscule in comparison to the rest of, uh, of capitalist world. The capitalists are not worried about, it, about us losing our uh, GDP. They're not even worried about us losing uh, if Facebook was forced to move on to Poland or Czechoslovakia or somewhere like that. What they're worried about is us creating a bad example. As Lenin talked about uh, with about the 1916 uprising, he said, it's so much more valuable to create a rising, to challenge the empire from within than if it had been some obscure peripheral part of the empire. Ireland is at the heart of the empire. What we have is, and this is where imperialism fears us because we speak English. I mean, I know that the Gilgory will regret this, but we do speak English. We have a wide diaspora across the world. We have an influence. And if Ireland was to go to the left, it would create the type of example that Cuba has caused for Latin America. And that's, that's what they're worried about. That's just, it's, not, it's not losing the, the tiny GDP. So that's what we're battling with, but it's the example we can create. And I think we've got to rely on, on the Irish, ultimately the Irish working class, as Connolly said, the last class, that, uh, the only class that we can rely on to liberate the people, obviously, because they, they, we have an interest in doing so, the working class has an interest in doing so. But uh, the main thing is to realize that the, at the moment, is to provide the analysis and deliver the narrative that we can change how to do it and keep remain optimistic that we can win because we will win and we're talking about the inevitability of Irish unity let's think too of the inevitability that Marx and Engels talked about the inevitability of of, of progressive humanity delivering that I think that's the message for us um, Colin I think if this is with Mark and our sort of trying to understand that I, the last century of, of uh, a century since the establishment of Stormont, um, if you look at the material base of unionism then and now, uh, the material base of unionism was, was uh, heavy engineering, shipbuilding, engineering, rope works, linen. It was a massive industrial uh, heartland of, of Ireland. It was the most industrialized part of Ireland. Um, the rest of Ireland, in many ways, was uh, agricultural dependency upon Britain. Um, and if you look at today, the north of Ireland, the steel and uh, the shipbuilding's gone, engineering is almost gone, uh, linen, all those heavy industries that, that, that once we were dependent upon the British Empire and controlled by unionism are almost gone. Um, and in the south, you've got an industrial base, while it's precarious, it is no longer the same agricultural dependency that it once was. Um, so there's a shifting dynamic within, within uh, the Ireland itself between unionism, the balance of forces within unionism in the north, which is in, as, as was in sharp decline from the 1960s onwards. And I think that today that is reflected in, in those elements within unionism who see that, uh, that their future may lie with, with Europe rather than with London. Um, and to a degree, it is a big problem with the north of Ireland. It has been a big problem in the north of Ireland is that uh, unionism have learned, uh, as once again, um, deception is the name of the game, um, and dependency is the name of the game, that um, they have little influence in London, they have little influence in Brussels, and they have little influence in Dublin. And therefore, they want to get influence. Uh, the vehicle to achieve that may well be, as they see it now, or maybe through, through Dublin, uh, into Brussels. Uh, because if it comes to London, they're going to get no influence, they're going to get no say, they're going to have no input into, into Brussels itself, uh, where they see as that's where the game lies, the game lies with Brussels, with the European Union. So I think that sort of dependency can, how do we develop, how do we develop, or how do we uh, exploit that dependency? 
How do we push for an All Ireland economic development? I think these are all crucial questions. I think that's about breaking down the uh, the rigidness of, of unionism. Uh, we talk about an All Ireland economic development. We talk about All Ireland economic and social uh, uh, demands, which from, the, from which break down that whole uh, unionist approach, uh, and also the to a degree the southern establishment approach. That we take these questions of uh, an All Ireland health service, an All Ireland education system. We see these and place them in a democratic way. This is about a democratic expression of the people. And I think that undermines, that can undermine unionism, can undermine this uh, free state, southern approach of the establishment that everything's cocooned in the 26 counties, that we open up that debate into that the solution to a health crisis is an all Ireland health system, uh, that an, an education system, which is all Ireland, which is embraces the people. I think these can open up doors for us to, to advance uh, and to break down these things. Because if unionism wants to hold on to, Alabama's union wants to hold on to the 26 counties in a very narrow sectarian position, then our policy must be about breaking that, challenging it, and opening it up. And the same in the south, if the southern establishment are quite happy with the 26 counties, then we challenge that and we break it down and break it down in, in the component parts that come forward with it. And I think with the Pattern Island Forum came forward with its uh, democratic program for the 21st century, I think it's, it's key in there. I think the question of democracy is key. Uh, the whole question of the not just the denial of democratic uh, national democracy and national unity, uh, but the whole question of people feel increasingly alienated from power from around their lives. Economic decisions, political decisions, social decisions are really are completely not only made beyond them. And I think the question of how we bring, how we institute, a, a, a engage in the discussion about real democracy, both political democracy, economic democracy, cultural democracy, social democracy. I think that's where we get into the heart of that debate. Around that, and I think that's where the, the conflict with uh, imperialism can uh, can we can find unity and of action, and I think that's where the crucial thing at this moment in time is about pushing forward demands which strengthen the hands, strengthen the unity of the working class, and weaken the power of capital. I think that's what we need to be looking at: is weaken how what demands weaken uh, weakens unionism, weakens. Uh, uh, to degree imperialism, imperialism has got a strategy to divide and rule. And what pro what policy we come forward? Do we come forward with which can, brings about some degree of unity? And to a degree, demands like a unified health service uh, nationally. I think that's a strengthening. It strengthens the actually how working class people see things, how they experience things, and how they receive things. I think that would be important in the economic social strategy uh, of an on an all Ireland basis. Therefore, it stops the idea of. Um, the people, the people, the, the, the northern executive saying, "Well, we're going to cut corporations tax to match this." In other words, the, the, the big monopolists can play off the northern administration against the Dublin government and stuff like that. So, I think things that got a, an all Ireland economic and social strategy, I think, would be crucial about building how would, about really, really building an indigenous, an indigenous base using the natural resources that we have. I think that way we're we're binding more unity. Uh, the things would bring us together rather than looking at the things which, which those forces who are opposed to us constantly look for the point of division, because division is where they prosper. And, uh, okay. they On that, Eugene, and, and, and I'm going to put to you, Paul, um, how, do, because of the, the trend within those who want to democratise on that national basis seems to be along bourgeois lines, how do we put, bring forward the class interest, Paul, so that we don't end up with a a uh, bourgeois democracy um, um, replacing an imperial entity that might have been even more um, reactionary and more um, regressive. But how do we bring forward that that issue of class and um, the class rights and the demand to control um, what we produce? And in that, in line with that, how do we challenge the structural? Um, entities that and, and, and forces that have been created around the Good Friday Agreement, um, which seem now to be dominating the conversation and, and dictating the parameters of the conversation. I, th I think it's very, as Tommy mentioned, or as Tommy mentioned, our great friend Antonio Gramsci, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I think if we ever get intellectually optimistic, I think we need to give up because I think the chances are not good. We have to, but we have to be all the time critical and vigilant because to be frank, we failed. I think we need to have that balance sheet, you know, and whether it's Pat O'Donnell or people for profit or other progressive movements, we've not been able to do that. And we have to, it's not our fault. 
you know, it's in a relationship breaks down, you say, it's not my fault, it's yours. Well, it, it's partly our fault because we're not able, whatever it is, to make that leap. There, there's a touchstone and it's what we're always searching for. It's what you, you ask that question, trying to think what would make, make the difference, for example. I mean, if you take, go back to the question in Scotland, since the, since the last referendum, this by way of how, how, how to, you, do, I, you don't, I mean, I don't know it, how to do it. But after the last, leading up to the, the independence referendum 214, there was something like 80, 90% of people in favour of Scottish independence. By the time the vote passed, you know, it, it almost won. You know, people were saying if, if the independence movement gets 30%, that's great, you know. But what mobilised, there was a whole series of movements, young, mostly young people on the left, ecological left, revolutionary left, and fragments of, of movements that had been there before, doing, you know, re reasonably successful. And after the failure of the, the, the referendum, everything that the left had said, around, you know, radical independence campaign, and, and the SNP itself were shown to be true. You know, there's no all the bullshit about that the Tories had promised, you know, to win people and the, the Labour Party as well. The unionists had promised to make, you know, to give Scotland if he stayed in, in the UK. They're all shown to be rubbish. And for, you know, for six, seven years, people have been saying, I've been saying, let's build the left, let's build the left. I mean, a comrade and friend of, of, of our, of, of Pat O'Donnell, you know, Alan Armstrong has been doing great work and, and, and that, the current in Scotland has been doing great work. And suddenly, Alex Salmon, you know, who, who, who was a pariah, so that's a party called Alba. And suddenly you get, you know, both from former Communist Party members, the Labour Party left, radical independence campaign, all, all going towards that, towards that movement as a left pole. I mean, I'm still working through exactly what, it, what, it, the, what the consequences of ALBA are, the ALBA party are. But sometimes you can't say what the, what the, the trigger is to provide an alternative to the, because the SNP is a right wing social, I'm not even sure you'd say it's a social democratic party, but, it, but anyway, but it's had that radical dynamic in Scotland, certainly for the left, the Labour Party, which might not be very difficult, but even under Corbyn. And it's difficult to get that margin. So how do you do that in the North? And I, I like in what's happened, you know, we're, we're, we've all got issues with the Good Friday Agreement. I don't think any of us agree with it. But, but imagine, you know, if you say that, you're immediate, it's a bit like saying you want to support Palestine, now you're anti-Semitic. In Britain, suddenly the whole, and I hear today history books for children are, are being rewritten in Britain to accommodate the Israeli view of, of what happened in Palestine. But talking about hegemony, how to break the hegemony of the dominant class, how to break the hegemony of the bourgeoisie, it's very, very difficult, but it can come in very, can come from very peculiar, you know, points of departure. I mean, civil rights movement, who would have thought we'd have a 40 year war against Britain and Ireland over the fact that people couldn't, um, you know, people couldn't get, there wasn't proper housing. Do, do you know what I mean? What, what are the slow, what's the, what's the campaigns or the, the biggest movement in the Republic of Ireland ever, around the, the you know the, the the right right to water campaign. So who would have thought that there would have been a, you know, a movement like that? So it's how to see, try and get an idea of what you know what the move what how to break the hegemonic grip of the dominant social forces are, and probably anybody you talk to on the Falls Road would agree with anybody with. Politics, who's not in the Sinn Fein party, probably wouldn't disagree with what we're saying. You know, it's kind of okay, it's obvious. And that even so many people now will be voting Sinn Fein holding their nose. But as soon as you say the Pat O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum, or, you know, so the, you know, how do we get unity amongst ourselves? Can we start with that as well? Is that, how do we do that? And we can't say, well, the Pat O'Donnell Forum is quite remarkable, okay? Because it does, it does give people, it does make it difficult for people to say, I'm not going to talk to you or I'm not going to participate in meetings because of who you, because what are you? Because what you're doing is you're putting forward a series of, dem of, of, of demands or positions, which people on the left find difficult to, to gain, say, and you're not saying you have to be part of us to support what we're doing. And it's the old Leninist principle, 
you know, march together and strike separately if you want, but we have to march together so we can strike separately. If we strike separately and march separately, we're finished. So we have to think about how we can get unity, you know, or an alliance amongst ourselves. And then we can challenge the hegemony of the force, they challenge the hegemony of the Good Friday Agreement, the interpretation. If you don't agree with it, you know, you're a tail ender, you know, you, you refuse to give up your gun and you have an argument where you've got, you know, with guns. It, it takes, it, they, they're able to win the argument before they start, like the whole issue about with their comrade today over, over the funerals. It's preposterous, but, you know, given what the Sinn Féin party have been doing, you know, funerals and so on. Okay. Tommy and, and, so, and Eugene, and we're going to cut it that time. That's excellent, Paul. Um, could right. just finish off and, and, and we we'll round up here. You want to, any of these want to make final comments? I the final comment is that we should not be uh, uh, too pessimistic. I think uh, to believe sometimes we fall for the trap that imperialism is all powerful and uh, without difficulties. I think imperialism has got many contradictions, uh, and I think the most important thing is to we should need to do is to focus upon where we think we can advance uh, issues, and that um, if there are major con contradictions between. Uh, European Union and Britain, I think that's where we need to be well, to work upon to develop them and to agree. I think that's where we need to develop them around the question of uh, intensifying the struggles around an oil and economy, intensifying the struggles around oil and and institutions, uh, bringing people together. I think this is where we can expose both the establishment in the South and also uh, continue to expose unionism and continue to expose the British. I think that's where we need to be uh, doing that. Um, I think we've got uh, we have something to offer the people. I think you need to be We have to have something to offer the people. You have to have the belief in that. I think the um, people are looking for a way forward. I think we need to uh, be in that debate. We need to be involved in that debate. And I think around the question of, of uh, about a border poll or all those questions, I think uh, the future is fought for today. What we do today shapes tomorrow. And I think it's crucial that the progressive uh, left Republicans are active in the debate today, tomorrow and next day. And I think that's, uh, that's where we need to be there today is to try to, what we've, the seeds you sow today will will, will find, will grow fertile. Uh, not Maybe not tomorrow, but the week after, the week after. I think that's what we need to be doing it out there, sowing the seeds uh, of progress, sowing the seeds of change, sowing the seeds of hope. Because I think an awful lot of people across the, everywhere, everywhere is a great sense of hopelessness, a great sense of nothing can be done, a great sense of powerlessness. And I think it's our job to show People have power. People have the potential to change. Working people have the potential to really change and, and transform society. And I think that's the message we need to, to, to constantly hammer home that you have the power with it, within it. We come together. We have the power to change. We have the power to change. And today's a tomorrow is shaped by our actions today. Yeah, and I give the final word to Tommy. Thanks for giving me the last word. I didn't expect this, but I'm not going to gain say that Paul or Eugene, the two of them have made a very fine contribution to and over and a very fine overview of what has been a very, I think, useful, enlightening discussion. And I think the thing to remember is the words Eugene has said that imperialism, capitalism, our opponents are not all powerful. And always keep in mind that on so many occasions in the past, working people, ordinary, the graph bubble, have shown their ability to transform society when least expected. And that's what we keep in mind, that optimism, that we can and will change this society in a progressive fashion. The arc of history is on our side, and that's what we'll, we'll hold on to. Okay, got a kid, Mike, Lish, I guess, a few. Thomas Mwinchu, Jokalev, Kelleru, Iriman, Nakaska. A Ganam shot, um, I guess, the much, um, but Jokal Majorash Lakila, a Swinchu earn, uh, Nashal Lake, um, Ganwell. All right, so see, thanks like everybody it. for the contributions, and we hope that, uh, you have a, um, a, a thoughtful Easter. <laughs>